Rob, if you've got a, uh, a Bible with you, it'd be great if you open it up to Isaiah chapter 49 and Isaiah chapter 50. We're going to look at those kind of areas together. Uh, Rob, I've got to say that uh, the, the uh, 1 Corinthians 13 challenge is an interesting one, my friend. Uh, I was speaking to Nikki and I'm sure that she said that you do that wonderfully well, that you are the uh, epitome of love and, and, and uh, all those expressions of it. But the problem was later on I was talking to your children and uh, it's those who know us closest who are the ones who uh, feel that the most, aren't they? So if you've got a Bible, Isaiah 49 and Isaiah 50 is where we're going to be kind of looking at today. Uh, many of you uh, would know that I am a uh, rather enthusiastic supporter of the mighty Hawthorne Football Club. Uh, I consider it immensely fortunate that as a uh, young boy growing up in the, uh, the mighty suburb of Dandenong, one of my local sports stores was owned by the, the greatest AFL player of all time, Lee Matthews. And, and if you visit the sports store, you've got to kind of you kind of got to brag for the team, don't you? Uh, I consider it uh, a very fortunate because the next closest sports store was owned by Robbie, uh, Robbie Flower. Uh, imagine supporting Melbourne for 50 years. Uh, go D's in 2021. <laughs> uh, the Hawks have been incredibly successful over my uh, lifetime, winning too, ma too many premierships to count, at least on my uh, fingers and toes. However, the truth is, is that no club can win all the time. And so at those times, you desire your club to conduct itself in a certain way. You hope that values like integrity and honesty and things that you aspire to can be lived out. Unfortunately, as Hawthorne fans have seen over the last couple of weeks, the gap between the vision for that and reality can be rather large, can't it? Power, egos, greed and desire can get in the way between what you hope for and what is lived out. And, and it's not only in sporting clubs where this exists, is it? In the corporate world, every major company that I know espouses a set of company values that they are meant to aspire to and live by. But too often we read about companies that have exploited workers and tax loopholes. They take shortcuts to put employees and consumers at risk in pursuit of what? Of greed and wealth and profit. We elect governments. We elect governments with the fundamental hope that they will pursue the well-being of our community, don't we? They will act with honesty, with justice and compassion. Uh, different ones may have different methods or different emphasis and, and methodology for achieving those ends, but we hope, we elect them on that basis that they will do so. But sadly, we see the brokenness of humanity spoil that hope, don't we? Ambition, deceit and greed tend to be the way that people describe our political leaders. In our families, you think about it in your families. As a parent, you might watch your child play sport and you want them to try to win. But you also want them to display graciousness if and when they lose. Sadly, the gap between vision and hope and reality can be large. In our churches, we aspire to be a community of love and compassion and grace and generosity to mark the way that we live, but sadly we fall short of this aspiration. Fear and insecurity, pride spoil that vision, don't they? And all of that, all of those different sections that I've even just mentioned just briefly, they all emerge from the brokenness of each of us as individuals, aren't we? Every man, every woman, every child. In so many of us all the time, the brokenness of humanity spoils that vision. You know, the nation of Israel had a very clear purpose and vision. It was to live as the children of God in a, in a covenantal, a, a, a promised relationship with the living God. To be a nation of justice, of compassion, to, compare, to, sorry, to, to care for those that had nothing, to welcome the stranger, to be an agent of peace and grace in the world. Israel was called to be a light to the nations. The problem was that as a nation, they had become disobedient and deaf to a loving God. Their brokenness spoils that vision. Now, when we read about these 
these events and these people and these situations, I, I think all the time we ask ourselves this question, is that the end of the story? Is the story laced with despair, despondency and desperation? Is that the end? Is there no hope in times of failure? I mean, the vision that, that God has for humanity, will God's plans be thwarted? Will, continue, will people continue to live in darkness with no hope of truly knowing God and living that way? For the nation of Israel, as we've been journeying through this time through the book of Isaiah, they would have been asking these questions and, and more about how we sustain ourselves through the time of exile when we've been taken into to captivity away from our homeland. We might ask questions, well, how could Israel change from being a faithless, rebellious people to those who are faithful? Or we might even ask it more generally, how do hearts change? We might even dare... We might even dare to ask that of ourselves. How does change happen? You know, in recent times, there's been a surprise TV hit. It's the, the Korean TV show, but it's come into, the, uh, into kind of the English world, The Mars Singer. And, and if you're like me and if you've never watched it, you can still probably guess the gist of the show. A celebrity, preferably at least C-grade, performs some sort of song wearing a goofy mask and costume, and you've got to have a panel, don't you? You know what's going to be on the panel, don't you? There's going to be a comedian. There's going to be some, um, some sort of retired muso and some other celebrity. And, of course, you, the viewer, try to work out who that person is. Throughout the book of Isaiah, there's been a mass Singer event going on. In, in fact, over 15 chapters from, from Isaiah 40 through to Isaiah 55, it reveals piece by piece, how, how change is going to happen. It reveals how God is going to bring about hope and grace and restoration that was promised and hoped for from the first 39 chapters of the book. That hope will come through this mystery person, the servant. And through four songs that are in a sense, sung about this servant, Isaiah communicates different aspects of the servant's identity. A few weeks ago, Ben shared from Isaiah chapter 42 about the servant. This servant that will bring about and rule with justice and righteousness. Who is this servant? Who is this source of hope? Who is under the mask, so to speak? I mean, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel believed that they, in a sense, were the masked singer. They were the servant of God. They were the source of hope for the world, the chosen people and the light for all the nations. Uh, today, we read, if you've got a Bible there with you, in Isaiah chapter 49, in verse 3 it says this, He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, and you will bring me glory. Here it apparently reveals the name of who the servant is, Israel. It would have confirmed their expectations, their hope and their plan. But is that possible? Is it possible that Israel is the servant? He said to me, you are my servant Israel. You will bring me glory. But the problem is this. Is that Israel the servant had become laced with failure, with faithlessness and rebellion. I mean, it reads that God intends to display his glory through this servant. Is Israel a display of the glory of God? If you wind your Bible back to Isaiah chapter 42, it describes Israel this way. It says, listen to you who are deaf. Look and see you blind. Who is as blind as my own people, my servant? Who is as deaf as my messenger? Who is as blind as my chosen people, the servant of the Lord? Here's the problem. Is that on the surface it looks like Israel should be the servant, the one who brings about this hope and this change in the world, but they're blind and deaf. 
Israel, in a sense, has been disqualified from this role. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 5, we read this, it says, And now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant. So, in a sense, here's the sense of God talking to this servant who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. It says the servant has a ministry to Israel, to bring them back to God. And if you put your your thinking cap on, you realise, wait a sec, you cannot bring yourself back to God. A nation cannot be its own saviour from sin. The servant must be someone else. And so we're forced, we're forced by the material to face this question, who is this servant? Who is this one? Who is the one who will rule with justice? Who will be a light to the Gentiles, to people who don't know God? Who will be the servant that accomplishes the the mission and the plan of God? I mean, the servant must fulfil the mission that Israel has failed to do. Israel can no longer do it, so there must be a new Israel. You, You might be able to know where this is heading. Guess what the answer is? Because the truth is, is that there's only one possibility exists here. Who is this servant? It's Jesus. Jesus, the one that brings glory to God. The one that rules with with justice and righteousness. We can say we know the answer because we stand in this sense of future knowledge. Jesus has come. He's begun the, the kingdom of God, inaugurated the kingdom of God that will bring and restore hope and meaning and justice and righteousness. But the Israelites didn't know this and they didn't understand, to be frank. So more information is needed. What will this servant do? And once again, the prophet asked them to pay attention. In verse 1 of 49, it says, Listen to me, all of you who are in distant lands. Pay attention, you who are far away. The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called me by name. It says this, all the nations are to benefit from the work of this servant. So he calls them to listen. Israel had the light. They knew about God, but they needed restoration. The rest of humanity didn't know this light, but they equally needed restoration as well. Listen to this good news. Listen to this message. Like the prophet Isaiah, this servant is chosen before the beginning of time, before birth. These are the plans of the sovereign, the almighty, the all-knowing God that have been, in a sense, waiting until they will be enacted for the right moment. What does this servant do? This servant will fulfil the mission of Israel. We've already read that they will rule with, with justice and with righteousness. In verse 5, we read before that they were commissioned to bring Israel back to God. But now we read further in verse 6, he says, You will do more than restore the people of Israel. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. You will bring salvation. You will bring hope. You will bring reconciliation to the ends of the earth. Here the servant is the conduit for this coming hope, for this coming salvation for all of humanity. It reminds us, it says, the servant's message will hit the spot. It uses this imagery, if you read the text that surround this, of, of swords and arrows, because there is power, there is accuracy in, in, in what the servant will do. While the nation of Israel was rebellious and stubborn, the servant lovingly and caringly would reach out to all. And again... We look back and we see Jesus. We see Jesus, the one who is compassionate, the one who brings hope and restoration. But frustratingly, we know as we read here in this passage that so often this this servant's message would be rejected. The world will see him and so often not pay attention, not understand. The Israelites didn't. Listen to their cry. Has God forgotten us? Has God forgotten us? Yet Jerusalem says the Lord has deserted us. 
the Lord has forgotten us. This is their complaint, their whinge. They had forgotten their calling. The world may be singing for joy at experiencing light from the servant, but all they can do is grumble. They get lost in the immediate suffering and struggle that they're experiencing. And, and somehow, amazingly, God responds in this moment, not with harsh condemnation and judgment, but with comfort. The sovereign Lord has given me, given the servant, his words of wisdom, so that he knows how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his word. For this is the nature of the servant. This is the nature of Jesus. I have to say, I find this, this verse deeply meaningful. The complaint that God has forgotten us. And yet the servant responds with words of comfort. Each day he wakens me and opens my understanding. It's like the servant knows what's going on in my heart, in my head, for you. And the servant then has the right thing to say, the reminder that we need. I have to say, I know some people who are kind of like this a little bit, they're the people that they head into a difficult situation. Maybe they're going to visit someone in, in very trying circumstances. Maybe a broken relationship or a severe illness, the loss of a loved one. And it seems that they have the right word at the right time. They know when to speak and when to be silent. They know when to give someone space and when to give someone a hug. People like me, we, we pray for this leading to have the right word at the right time so that we know how to comfort the weary. But the servant is the one who ultimately knows how to do this. Maybe that's even needed for you today in whatever space you're in. You need to hear the words of wisdom of the servant, of Jesus. You need to experience fresh grace or kindness, strength, or hope. See, the servant leads each day as we follow. He sustains the weary with a word. And furthermore, to what the servant says is what the servant does. The sovereign Lord has spoken to me, and I have listened. This is the servant saying these words. I have not rebelled or turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone, determined to do his will, and I know that I will not be put to shame. You see, here we see expressed again and again, in contrast to the rebelliousness of the nation of Israel and, and through their shunning and walking away from God, the servant is obedient. They speak the words of God. They have ears which are attentive to God. They do not rebel or turn away from God. For the servant is determined to do the will of God. Israel might be rebellious, but the servant Jesus is responsib responsible and obedient even when there is a time, a clear time of suffering that is, that is laying ahead. He does not draw back but offers his body to his tormentors. He obeys despite the persecution. And in fact, as you read further along, it becomes clear that the servant's obedience to God leads to further persecution and further rejection. In chapter 49, it talks about how the servant was deeply despised, but in chapter 50, he's assaulted. yet he will be able to endure as the Holy One of Israel. 
You know, these words on paper or, or papyrus may have seemed theoretical in the day of Isaiah. But I invite you to read the Gospels written about Jesus. Read the passion narrative of his suffering and execution and then understand about a little bit more about what it means to obey through persecution. For in this text, amazingly, we get sort of this future prophecy about what Jesus will experience. And yet he remains obedient. lives a life of faith, of trusting in God's promises. For this is Jesus. This is Jesus who who gives us those words that strengthen us. This is Jesus who, who is our model of obedience, our example. If you cycle a little bit further on to verse 10, it says... Who among you fears the Lord and obeys his servants? This is now a word to us. This is a word to Israel in its day, but it's a word to us. If you are walking in darkness without a ray of light, trust in the Lord and rely on your God. Now, we don't stand in ancient times when these words from the prophet must have seemed somewhat disconnected from life, it must have seemed very difficult to comprehend what they were speaking of. Different ones from our team are going to speak, but in a couple of weeks' time we will get to Isaiah 53 as well. These are words which speak of, of execution on a cross that did not exist in those days. They are words which must have seemed alien to those who are listening and difficult to comprehend. But for each of us, we stand here today in a different time and space. We can look back from 2021, look back to these ancient times and see these these prophetic words fulfilled in the life of Jesus. The one who came to bring hope. The one who sustains the weary. The one who was obedient, who then we put our hope and trust in. It's easy to see the parallel between the nation of Israel and then to see the church. And it's true to an extent For as much as we, the church, the followers of Jesus, can be rebellious, that we still now live in the truth and the life of the resurrection of Jesus. We know what it is to understand Jesus as saviour, as comforter, as model. That's why we follow Jesus the servant of the Most High God, the one who is our light, the one who comforts, the one who is our model for obedience. But as we are encouraged and live in that comfort and hope, we are also, I've got to say, challenged to live that out. We are called the same as Israel was, but for the church is to live as a light to the nations to be a light to the nations, to expose the nations to that light so that others may also find that peace and that forgiveness and reconciliation. We are called to be obedient in times of persecution. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, these words, it says, Have you not forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you for... What does it say? For God disciplines those that he loves. Punishment is not for sin, way it would have been seen in Israel back in that time, but it's to bring about and to prepare us for glory. We are called, we are called to live as followers of the servant, to be strengthened and heartened, but to live in that power and that authority and that hope to live as light. 
You know, the story of Israel in, in ancient times was devastating. The persistent blindness and deafness of God's people essentially led to the postponement of God's exodus plan. God's plan to pull people out of slavery and into freedom and hope. And their deafness and their rebelliousness pushed hold. But in Jesus, that exile has ended. The new rescue from slavery has come to fruition. It's come about. And we, the people of God, are called to live in the truth of that hope. Do you believe that? Not only do you believe that, do you live that? To be a light to the nations, to comfort the weary, to live obedient lives to the Most High God. For God calls each one of us, God calls us collectively to live as His people, sharing in that mission for each one of us. And I want to say to each one of you, I invite you to join in that mission with us. To join in that together. Let's pray, shall we? For our God, that we thank you that ultimately we look for help to your servant. We look to Jesus, the one who, who came without glory and honour and power. The one who lived the life of compassion and justice and love. The one who endured great suffering and persecution so that we all could be reconciled to you. Our God, we pray that today that you would remind us and imprint that on our hearts, in our head and on our hands so that we might truly live as your people and share in that mission.